Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for coming along. I'm Andrew. I'm a software engineer on the ExoPlayer team. And I'm Mark. I'm developer advocate for Android Media. So in today's session, we're hoping to demonstrate how you can build really, really fully featured media playback functionality into your apps using quite little code using ExoPlayer. And to do that, we're going to guide you through the process of building two applications. We're going to start by focusing on the video use case. We're going to build a simple video player app that will play an MP4 stream. Then we're going to show you how to insert ads alongside that video content. Then we're going to shift our focus to audio. We're going to show you how to play audio in a background service. We're going to show you how to integrate with Android media sessions. And finally, we're going to take a look at some new functionality we've recently released for downloading media for offline playback. Uh, so like last year, we're hoping to have a mixture of some introductory content and also some coverage of slightly more tricky use cases. So hopefully, there's something for everyone. And with that in mind, I'm going to start by saying a bit about what ExoPlayer is for anyone who hasn't used the library before. OK. Clicker doesn't seem to be working. Next slide. Great. Um, so ExoPlayer is an application-level media player. That means that you choose which version of ExoPlayer you'd like to use, and then you bundle the player implementation into your application as a dependency. And what that gives you is consistent playback functionality across all different Android versions and across all different devices. ExoPlayer works from API 16, that's Android Jelly Bean, upwards. So with that, you can reach more than 99% of active devices. The project is open source. It's hosted on GitHub. And we have an active community there. And you can file issues with feature requests, bugs, and you can even send us pull requests. ExoPlayer is also quite widely used, both within Google applications like the YouTube app for Android and also in Google Play Movies. It's also quite widely used in the wider Android community. Um, and there are actually over 200,000 applications on the Play Store that are using ExoPlayer. Um, and the team's always really excited to see the kind of great products that you're all building using ExoPlayer. Since last year's talk, we've been working hard on both stability and performance improvements behind the scenes, but also on some brand new features. And in doing that, uh, ExoPlayer is gradually evolving into quite a fully featured solution for media playback. So uh, here's uh, some of the highlights of the features that we've added over the past year. Uh, there's much too much to go into detail on here, uh, but I'd encourage you to check out the release notes in the root directory of our GitHub project, uh, where you can find full details of all of the changes included in each new release of the player. In today's talk, we're just going to cover a few highlights, including support for downloading media, as I mentioned, and also support for player notifications. OK, I think that's enough on the slides. Um, let's get on with some live coding. And for each of these two apps, our video app and our audio app, our starting point will be a mostly empty project, um, because we want to show you as much of the interesting code as possible. But we're going to provide a link to a branch on our GitHub project where you can check out the code afterwards if you want to look at things in a bit more detail. OK, Mark, are you ready to do some furious typing? Yes, I am. Great. OK, um, if we could switch to the laptop, please. Um, our starting point is a, is a mostly empty project, as I mentioned. Um, we're going to make a video player app where we start playing the stream as soon as the app comes into the foreground, and then we stop playing the stream when we go into the background. And to do that, the first step is going to be to add a dependency on the ExoPlayer core library. And this provides the main interface to the player that you can use to control playback from within code. As you can see, Mark's added a dependency on the core library with the version 2.8.0, which is the new release that we've done this week. He's also added a, dependency, added a dependency on the optional UI module. This provides some customizable high-level UI components, which you can put into your applications for things like showing a video player in a view. That's player view, which we're going to use today. And it also provides playback control view and some other components. And these are all very customizable. So you can change which icons you're using. You can customize the layouts and so on. So you can see that Mark has added a player view, which is going to fill the activity. And he's given it an identifier, player underscore view, so we'll be able to access it from code. Now if we switch over to our main activity, we can see in our onCreate method, uh, we can get access to that view using find view by ID. And once we've got access to that view, then the next step we're going to take is to actually initialize the player. OK. So once we've got our player view in a field, let's override the onStart method. 
Uh, and then on start, we're going to initialize the player. To initialize the player, we're going to use a static method on the exo player factory called new simple instance. This is going to give us a simple exo player instance. Now, it might sound like simple exo player is only for really basic stuff, but actually, simple exo player is our recommended way of integrating at the moment because it provides, it does lots of things for you. For example, handling the lifecycle of the surface holder for video output. You can see also that we're passing in, as well as a context, a track selector implementation. In this example, we're going to use a default track selector. But this is an example of a pattern which is very common in ExoPlayer's API, where you pass in a dependency of a component. In this case, um, we're passing in a default track selector, but you could pass in your own track selector implementation if you wanted to have much more control over how track selection is working. So Mark's already gone ahead, and he's bound the player to the player view so that the player's output is going to appear in that particular view. OK. So the next step is to tell ExoPlayer what we want to play. And for that, there are really two parts. The first one is to provide a factory for data sources. Data sources tell ExoPlayer how to load data, for example, using a particular HTTP stack or loading files from the local device. In this example, we're using a default data source, which is suitable for many use cases. It provides loading for HTTP URLs, files from the local disk, uh, assets and resources bundled into your AVK, and so on. But if you wanted to, for example, use the Chromium network stack here, then you could use a Cronet data source factory. OK, so that's the first part of telling ExoPlayer what to load. The next part is specifying a media source. Your choice of media source is going to depend on the type of media you're trying to play. In this example, we're going to be playing an MP4, so we're going to use an extractor media source, which supports formats like MP4, MP3, Matroska, and so on. If you wanted to play Dash or HLS or smooth streaming streams, then you would use the corresponding media sources for those different formats. And you can see that Mark's passing in the URI to our MP4 when he's creating the media source. OK, once we've got our media source, now we just need to prepare the player to start buffering data. So we'll pass that to the prepare method. Then we're going to call set play when ready to tell the player that as soon as it transitions from the buffering state to the ready state, then playback should begin automatically. Having done that, all that remains is to clean up um, when the activity goes into the background. So we'll override on destroy, uh, sorry, on stop. Okay. And in that, we're going to clear the player reference on the player view. And then we're going to release the player. Okay, and this is kind of the, the minimal code you need just to, to play a video stream. Uh, let's go ahead and deploy that to the device now. And if we could switch to the phone, please. Hopefully, you haven't missed out anything. So when, when the application's uh, been installed on the device, the device, you should see the video starts to play automatically. Uh, and uh, you can see that if you tap People on the video, you get some mobile devices simple playback devices. controls. Uh, pretty much what you'd expect from a video player app. So you can pause and resume. You can seek around, and so on. OK. Um, let's, uh, let's now switch back to the laptop, please. So let's imagine we've launched our video app. Um, if we could switch to the laptop, please. We've launched our video app. And now we'd like to think about how we're going to monetize our content by showing ads. This is extremely easy to do with ExoPlayer. We've recently added. Uh, an IMA extension, which makes this very easy. So ExoPlayer extensions are wrappers around external functionality that make it very easy to use with ExoPlayer. In this case, the IMA extension is a wrapper around the Interactive Media Ads SDK, which provides support for loading XML ad tags in VAST and VMAP formats, which is a standard format for information about ads. So we're going to be using that to load ads, and then we're going to insert it within the content in our player. So Mark's going to create a ads loader, which is a we're going to use an IMA ads loader, which is the object that's provided by the IMA extension. This is going to take the context and an ad tag URI, which is the URI of an XML document specifying what ads to play where in the content. So we're going to create that ads loader in onCreate, and then we're going to release it in onDestroy. The reason we're using onCreate and onDestroy is that that ads loader contains information about which ads have already been played. So we want to make sure that if the app goes into the background and comes back into the foreground, we don't show the same ads multiple times. OK. Um, as I mentioned before, media sources are how we tell ExoPlayer what to play. And in order to play ads, we use the predictably named ads media source. 
So we're going to create an ads media source. We'll pass in the content media source that we want to play. We'll pass in a data source factory, which is going to be used to load data for playing the ads. We'll pass in the ads loader. And finally, we'll pass in a view group that's on top of the player. And that's going to be used to show any user interface associated with ads, like, for example, a skip button. And building an ads media source out of a content media source like this is an example of media source composition. And this is something that you can do with ExoPlayer. Um, we'll see some more examples of that later when we look at playlists. OK, so we, we prepare the player with the ads media source, and then we should be good to go. So you can see we hopefully, hopefully this will work. If we could switch to the phone. Um, we were able to add support for playing ads with maybe 10 or so lines of code. And actually, this, this way of integrating the uh, IMA SDK gives a really good user experience, because ExoPlayer knows about which ads are coming up in the future. And that means that it's going to be able to buffer the content in advance and the ads. It can buffer the ads in advance to give you seamless transitions between ads and content. So as you saw, we had a pre-roll ad at the beginning. And now the time bar has little yellow markers, which are showing us the positions of ads within the content. And ExoPlayer is taking care of all of the, the difficulty of loading the ads and buffering everything behind the scenes for us. OK, so that's ad playback. And now over to Mark to talk a bit about audio. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. <coughs> so far, we focused on video only. So let's switch to another application and look a little bit into audio playback. Audio playback is a little bit more challenging because we want to enable the user to put our application into the background and use another application, and audio should still keep playing in the background. For this, we are going to use a so-called foreground service. It's called a foreground service because we need to attach a notification to this service, and this notification is in the foreground, is visible to the user, so the user is always aware we are doing some work in the background. <coughs> Since Oreo, such, an, such a foreground service is a mandatory requirement. If we don't put our service into the foreground, the system will kill our service and the application crashes. So let's have a look at the starting point of our foreground service. And let's switch back to the uh, laptop, please. Yes, we see here uh, we have this audio player service, which extends from the service. We have already overwritten the onCreate method, where we put the code from our video sample, where we initialize and prepare the player with a single media item. In onDestroy, we release our resources. And finally, in onStartCommand, we return start, start sticky, so the service is not immediately destroyed. And we can explicitly terminate our service when we are ready, <coughs> when we are finished with audio playback. The service is also already registered in the manifest. We have this simple service element, which just points to our audio player service clause. And finally, we need to have a way to start our service. We do this in the main activity, in the onCreate method of the main activity. Here we create an intent pointing to our audio player service, and then we use a static method of the ExoPlayer library, which starts the service in foreground according to the to the API level. <clears throat> so now let's go back into the audio player service again, and let's change this code a little bit uh, of the, where we initialize our player. Because for audio, we don't want to only support playing a single media item. We want to support playlists, so the user can, can move to the next or to the previous item, or can just let the playlist play one item after the other. <clears throat> With ExoPlayer, we are using a concatenating media source to implement playlists. <clears throat> this concatenating media source just joins together a number of media sources and plays them gaplessly and without rebuffering in between. So we achieve a pretty nice user experience for, for audio playback. The concatenating media source also allows us to dynamically change the playlist, so we can add and remove media sources while the player is playing. Or we can even move the currently playing item in our playlist while the player is playing. That's pretty neat. So Andrew already started to iterate over our samples array. And for each sample, we get a URI. We again are going to create an extractor media source. But then we add this extractor media source to our concatenating media source. In the end, we prepare our player with this concatenating media source, and we are already done. We are now supporting playlists with gapless play, gapless, which play gaplessly and without rebuffering. So, but now 
let's have a look at our service again and make it a proper foreground service. We've already said we need to attach a notification to our foreground service. And for this, we are going to use the player notification service manager. The player notification manager will not only create the notification, but it will keep it nicely in sync with the state of the player. So each time the player state changes, the manager will update the notification and post it to our drawer again. We use a static method to create this player notification manager, and we need to pass a couple of arguments to it. First, we need to pass the context. Then we need to pass the channel ID, which identifies our channel to which we post our notification. The next parameter is a string identifier, which, which gives us a localized name for our channel. This is the name which shows up in the settings dialog, where our user maybe want to mute our notification channel. And then the next parameter is a notification ID to identify, identify our notification. And finally, we need to pass a so-called media description adapter. The manager will use our adapter to get information about the currently playing item. So each time the notification is rebuilt, the adapter is called to get this information. So we see that for each of those uh, callbacks, the player instance is passed to the method. So we can use this player, this player to get the current window index. The current window index gives us the index to pick our sample out of our samples array, which is kind of the playlist. We return the title to get a content title. Then we have a pretty similar method where we just return the description, which is a longer text which is displayed in a context in a notification. And finally, we also provide a bitmap to make our notification a little bit nicer. <coughs> we just use a convenient method of our samples to get such a bitmap for each of our samples. Finally, we also need to provide a pending intent. This pending intent is fired when the user taps on the notification. And we want to get the user back to our application, in, this in our example, to the main activity. The activity. So we create an intent pointing to our main activity, and then we wrap this intent into a pending intent, which we are using with the static method get activities on the pending intent. Here again, a couple of arguments, the context as the first argument, then a request code, which is zero in our case. We are not going to use it in our sample. Then the intent pointing to our main activity. And finally, a flag to tell the system to update any pending intents already in the queue. So now we have this player notification manager. We now also need to register a notification listener. This listener makes our service aware of the life cycle of our notification. It has two methods. So we register uh, this notification uh, listener, which is a, an uh, anonymous class in this case. The first method, or notification started, is called when the notification is initially created. Here, we are now pass those two arguments to the start foreground service. And this is now the moment where our service is officially a foreground service. We are now safe. The system is not going to kill our service anymore. The next method, then, is called when the notification is canceled. Here we just stop self our service because we want to terminate the service. Finally, we also need to register the player. We set the player with the set player method on the notification manager, so the notification manager can sync the player state to the notification. So that's about it. We also need to clean up in the onDestroy method. Here we just null the set the player instance again, so we don't leak a player, a player reference when the service is being destroyed. So now please change back to the phone, and if we done everything right, we should now be able to hear the playlist playing in our service. The application comes up. We see the notification in the drawer. We did not it's playing. Then let's have a look at the notification in the drawer. We see here the information which it comes from our adapter. We can use the playback controls to control playback. We can pause or start again. We can skip to the next item. And if we tap on the notification, it gets us back to the application. So fine. <clears throat>
So as a next step, we have seen now that this notification contains information about the current item and about the state, and it lets the user control the media playback. What if we want to expose this functionality to external application? Let's go to the next. Can we go back to the slides, please? Thank you. Google Assistant, for example, may want to. Yeah, here we are. Here we go. Google Assistant, for example, wants to allow the user to use voice commands to control media playback. Android Auto or Wear OS let the user remote control, remote control a media application and browse in a media catalog of our application. <clears throat> The Android framework has a solution for this, because we essentially need to provide three things to let external application participate in media playback. First, we need to expose the playback state. This is the things like the player state itself, the current media item, or the playlist with which we prepared our player. Second, we need to be able to retrieve playback commands from external, command, external application, so we can execute those commands on our player instance. And third, we need to provide ways to browse in our media catalog. The Android framework provides a solution for this. It provides the media session and the media browser service. We are not going into the detail of the media browser service because we don't have time for this, but we, let, we look at the media session, which allows us to expose the playback state and retrieve playback commands. <laughs> In our code sample, we are going to use the media session connector, which is part of the media session extension of the ExoPlayer library. This media session connector synchronizes the player state with the state of the media session and retrieves commands from the media session. So let's change again back to the laptop, please, so we can see how we can do this in code. We are again in the onCreate method of our player of our audio player service, and we are now going to create an instance of a media session, session compart. We assign it to a field. We just call the media session compart constructor with, with the context and an identifier, which is, the media, which is just a string. Then we immediately set our media session to active by, call, by passing true to the set active method. Now, as a first step, we want to make the player notification manager aware of our session. And we pass the token to the player notification manager so we can en enhance the media style notification and provide an, art an artwork for our lock screen of our device. But now, we are going to create such a media session connector. We call the constructor and we just pass the media session to the connector so he has access to the session. We've said we want to synchronize our playlist with the queue of the media session, so external application know what items we are having in our playlist. For this, we are going to use a timeline queue navigator. The timeline is the internal representation of the playlist after the player has been prepared. So there are as many windows in our timeline as we have items in our playlist. So with this, we can use the window index, which is the parameter which is passed to our, uh, our method we are going to override to create, to get the samples again out of our, our samples array. And we then are going to create a media description for such a sample. Let's have a look in this uh, get media description method to see that there is not much magic behind it. We see we are just using a media description compat builder, and then we populate this data with the data from our samples, and then we build such a media description compat which we return to our connector. <coughs> so now we have our We've already this media session connector. As a next step, again, we need to pass the player to the connector so we can sync the player with the media session. Here, we again set, use the set player method. The first parameter is the player itself. The second parameter is a playback preparer. We are not going to use it because we don't want to allow external application to initiate playback in our sample. So that's kind of it. Again, in on destroy, we need to clean up. First, we just release the media session, and as a second step, we again set the player instance to null, this time in the connector, to avoid leaking an instance of the player. 
So now, that's kind of it. If everything is correct, we should be able to deploy the application again. Please switch to the phone again. And Andrew should now be able to use Android Google Assistant to skip to the next item. Let's see if this works. Play next track. Why? Fine. Well done. Thank you. And now, now over to Andrew again for downloading an offline functionality. Thank you, Mark. If we could switch back to the slides, please. Um, okay. So another feature of media apps that I'm sure you're all familiar with is support for downloading media for offline playback. This is really important if your users are going to be in a situation where they have no connectivity or intermittent connectivity. Um, this has been a much requested feature for a while now, and we're really pleased that we've been able to launch this in our 2.8.0 release this week. In ExoPlayer, our support for downloading is built on top of our support for caching. So I'm going to um, say a little bit about how caching fits into the picture of the player setup, and then we'll look at how downloading builds on top of that. So this diagram is intended to show the data flow when playing one MP3 file. We have a song which is in the cloud somewhere. We have a data source which is requesting that over HTTP. It's loading the data. And then we had a media source that was getting the information from there and providing it to the player. Let's see how caching fits into this. Well, it's quite simple. We just add a cache data source. That sits in between the data source we're using for loading from the network and the media source that's providing data to the player. And it's going to be responsible for dealing with a cache instance. In this case, we're using a simple cache, which is provided by ExoPlayer's core library. The way this works is as follows. When the media source requests some data, it's going to ask the, ask the cache data source to provide that information. The cache data source is going to look in the cache. If it's present there, then that's great. We can get the data from local storage. That goes to the media source, and we never had to go to the network. On the other hand, if the data is not present in the cache, so we've got a cache miss, then the cache data source needs to go to the data source that's being used to load from the network, and it's going to request the data from there. And then it's going to store it in the cache when it arrives. And in this way, the cache gradually gets populated with the data that's loaded while, du during playback. You can see also on this diagram, we've got a cache evictor. This component is responsible for making sure that our cache doesn't grow indefinitely as we play more and more different media items. OK, now let's move on to think about downloading. So downloading is a separate operation, which you might want to perform in the background, so it might need a service. And this downloading operation, what's going on internally is it's going to read through the entire stream. And as it does that, it'll be populating the same cache instance that you're using for playback. And as you can probably guess, when you do this operation, if you've populated the cache with all of the data, then when it comes to playback, your player is going to be able to get everything from the cache from the cache data source. There's never a need to go to the network in this case. One very important thing to note is that we've got a no-op cache evictor. So this is an implementation of cache evictor, which does nothing. Uh, it's never going to evict data from the cache. The reason we have that is that we don't want to have a situation whereby we're, lo we're downloading the stream, and then when we've downloaded up to a certain amount of data, we start getting rid of data at the beginning of the stream, because that would be very annoying for users. OK, so that's the theory. Let's see how this works in practice. If we could switch back to the laptop, please. So we're going to do this in three steps. The first step is we're going to add support for caching to our player. Then we're going to implement an audio download service, which is going to actually run the download operation as in the background. Then finally, we're going to add a very minimal piece of UI to our activity in order to let us trigger the downloads to take place. OK, uh, so we'll go ahead and create a cache data source factory. And as we saw on the slide, this is going to sit between our data source factory for loading from the network and the media source, which is actually going to be extracting the media. So you can see we're using a utility method to get our cache. Um, let's jump into that and see what's going on there. So as I mentioned, we're sharing the same cache for playback and downloading. And that means it's important that we just have a singleton for our whole process. Inside get cache, what we're doing is we check if we've got one already. Uh, if we don't have one, we're going to create a file which is pointing to a directory where we're going to store the downloads. Then we're going to instantiate a simple cache, passing in that directory. 
and also a no-op cache evictor, which is very important uh, because we don't want to be removing data from the cache. OK, so that's how we make a, a simple cache. We also need to provide the cache data source factory with the upstream data source factory for loading data from the network. OK, and that's all we need to instantiate a cache data source factory. Let's introduce a local variable for that. And then we're going to use that cache data source factory in place of the data source factory we were using before for loading from the network. OK, um, so hopefully that makes sense for adding support for caching to our player. Now we're going to move on, and we're going to add an audio download service, which is actually going to run the downloading operation. So we provide a super class for, um, called download service for your, for your download services that you'll be putting in your application. So we'll be inheriting from that here. OK. Um, so there's a few, things, few steps we need to do now. The most important one, important not to forget, is to add a declaration for the service to your manifest. So we're going to add our audio download service here. Now we can switch back, and we have to implement a constructor and three methods. So let's, let's start doing that. We'll create a constructor with no arguments, but then we're going to call the super constructor and pass in some information about the download notifications. So we'll need a notification ID, which must be different from the notification ID we used for audio playback. We'll also pass in an interval at which to update the, the notification, and we'll just use the default here. We'll pass, in, we'll pass in a channel ID for our download notification channel. And finally, we also need to provide a string resource which describes the notification channel. And that works just the same as the one we did for um, audio playback that had the notification channel as well. Now we need to override some methods. So let's have a look at those. The first one is we need to provide a download manager. And we have a utility method for this, which we'll have a look at in a second. That's just taking a context. Let's jump in there. So again, we're using a singleton instance of a download manager for our whole process. This is also creating a file because it needs to persist some information about downloads that are in progress. And then we're instantiating a download manager, passing in the same cache instance as the one that we're using for the cache during playback. You can see also there's a data source factory for loading data to populate the cache. And we've also got a deserializer for, pro for progressive download actions because we're downloading progressive media. OK. For get scheduler, for the purposes of our simple demo app, we're just going to leave this returning null. But in a real application, you would want to provide some kind of job scheduler so that the system can start your download service when your process isn't running in order to resume downloads. You can have a look at our full demo app for an example of how to do that. Finally, we're going to provide a progress notification. And we've got a handy utility method to build one here. This is going to take a context, an icon, which is going to be shown in the notification associated with the download that's in progress. And we'll just use our playback icon for, for that. Then we provide the download channel ID, which is the same one that we used earlier. Uh, this one's actually a string, not a resource. One, one parameter for our head. <laughs> OK, uh, so we get our download channel ID. For our, um, we actually need an intent next, which we'll just pass null for. I think we got a bit mixed up with the parameters here. So if you remove download channel name, no. <laughs> easily done. There's lots of parameters. <laughs> OK, then the message is null. Uh, content intent is null, the message is null, and we'll just pass our task states, uh, which has information about the downloads that are in progress, what their status is. Phew, that's a lot of parameters. OK, so that looks pretty good. Um, that's implementing our download service. The final step, I promise, is just providing a way to trigger these downloads from our activity. So as you can see, we've got an empty list view here. We're going to replace that with a list of samples. So we've just got three items in a playlist. When the user taps one of those, we're going to trigger the download to start. And to do that, we'll be creating a progressive download action. If you were downloading a different type of content, like a Dash stream, then you would not use progressive download action. You'd use the corresponding download action for the type of stream you're downloading. That's going to take a URI. It's going to take a flag to say whether we're removing or not. We want to add it to the cache, so we'll pass in false. We don't want to associate any custom data, so we'll pass null for the data and the custom cache key. 
Once we've created our progressive download action, all that remains is to call a method on the download service. There's a static method to start the service with that action. And that takes a context, which is main activity dot this, not the item click listener this. OK. Uh, it takes the class of the download service, which is audio download service dot class. It takes the download action, which we've just created, progressive download action. And finally, we can pass false for foreground because our activity is already in the foreground. OK, uh, there's quite a few bits to remember there, but hopefully we've got everything. Uh, let's give that a try and see if it works. Now, we had planned to show you putting the device into flight mode and playing back the downloaded content, but unfortunately, we're having to use cost to play the stream, so we won't actually be able to show you the, uh, putting the device in flight mode. You'll need to use your imagination. As you can see, when we tap the items, you get a little play icon, which is our download notification. And that's going to progress as the download progresses. Uh, and that's populating the cache in the background. OK. So that's pretty much it for downloading. Um, I'm now going to hand back over to Mark to say a few words about cost. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. So there is a last uh, important integration we did not cover in code, and we will not cover in code, is the integration with Google Cost. Google Cost is almost expected by all users, uh, by users to be supported by uh, media apps. We've recently added a Cost extension, which makes integration with Cost for ExoPlayer application pretty easier. Let's switch to the slides again, please. Q, the cost extension. The cost extension takes advantage of the player interface of the ExoPlayer library. All the UI components and other components, like the player notification manager, the media session connector, which we've seen in action, take advantage of this player interface and only rely on this player interface. The most prominent implementation of this player interface is the simple ExoPlayer. Almost all ExoPlayer applications use the simple ExoPlayer for local playback. The cost extension now adds another implementation of this player interface, which is the cost player. The cost player wraps the remote media client of the cost SDK, so it gets pretty easy to swap local playback done with the simple exo player with remote playback of the cost player. So if, because all those components of the exo player library and hopefully also your application only rely on the player interface, you can exchange this local playback with remote playback quite easily. You can also have a look at the cost demo application, which we added to our GitHub repository. And we have also a blog post on media, on Medium, which shows you how to set up the cost parts uh, for your application. OK, great. Thank you, Mark. Um, so all that remains, really, uh, is to provide you with a link to the branch, which has uh, the code that we've written today, or at least it will be very similar to the code we've written today. Um, and please go and check that out. Um, try it out. Uh, you'll actually be able to try the download functionality by putting your device into flight mode and making sure that it plays it back, which we can't do now. Um, so please check that out. We have an office hour session today at 3.30. Um, please come along if you've got questions. Um, lots of members of the team will be there, and we'd be delighted to meet you and find out about what you're doing with ExoPlayer and how we can help you with that. This is a link to our GitHub project, uh, if, you, if you haven't seen that before. We have a developer guide, which takes you through the process of getting started with ExoPlayer at a slightly slower pace, and it helps to explain some of the background. Um, and finally, as uh, Mark alluded to, we also have a blog on Medium, where members of the ExoPlayer team are writing blog posts about new functionality that we're working on. So please do check that out and subscribe. Um, and with that, uh, thank you very much. Yeah.